diet that is rich in a variety of different types of plants reverses biological age. I've seen that some of the most powerful molecules that we have tested are not your typical drug molecules, they're natural molecules that have come out of plants. When people say that food can be medicine, it literally can. As humans, we are not designed to be constantly eating. and We should have three meals a day. The reality is that this is something that's almost been manufactured by you know food industries because we were not designed to be eating continuously our biology is made so that we were out hunting we may eat and eat well but then go for a good while without eating again we know that fasting reduces inflammation but there's always people that are going to argue that one really extreme diet really works for them and that's probably because it does really do work for them <laughs> I think aesthetics is like a tiny little fish swimming along, just about to be eaten by a giant shark. That's what I think is going to happen in the next 10 years in the field of aesthetics and longevity. A lot of us are going to move slowly towards something that is a thousand times bigger than medical aesthetics. We'll still keep doing aesthetics, but it'll be a small part of what we do every single day. Aesthetics is changing. Longevity is the bigger future. If you want to be part of this, click on the link in the description of this video and sign up to the waiting list. Diet. Um, what do you think are the most important part? And underneath diet, we should also include fasting. Mm. So um, diet is probably the most confusing of all of them because there are so many different ways and so many confounding factors in, in these sorts of studies. But from your experience so far, what, what, what would you lean on with most confidence in terms of a healthy diet? So when it comes to longevity, I think there are two key things to remember when it comes to diet. The first is what you're eating and the second is when you were eating so in terms of what you're eating i think there's so many different diets and you know so many different nutritional experts you know some are saying count the calories some are saying don't count the calories some are saying go keto some are saying high protein there's a lot of conflicting inf information out there i think when it comes to specifically what you eat in, it is quite personalized in that our genetics does impact how we will respond to different foods. Um, but as a general rule of thumb for longevity, you wanna be make sure that you are not eating a diet that is inflammatory. And when I say a diet that's inflammatory, it's, you know, all the stuff I've kind of heard of before, which is that you're not eating loads of processed foods. You're not eating things that are high in all of the saturated fats, the um, seed oils, the things that are going to be causing an inflammatory response in your body, because we know that anything that is driving chronic inflammation is going to be leading to that hallmark of aging, which is inflammation, and is going to be driving the aging process. So so I think, it, you know, a really common sense approach in that you don't want to be sitting eating a load of rubbish and, um, you know, sugary foods and burgers and things that are going to be driving inflammation. What we do know in terms of diet is that a diet that is, is rich in a variety of different types of plants reverses biological age. So it helps to reduce the hallmarks of aging. And when I say it's rich in a variety of different plants, it doesn't mean that you need to be vegan. You can still eat meat. You just need to increase the variety of plant materials that you're eating. And it's um, recommended to eat around 30 different plants per week. Now, that sounds like a lot, but actually when you break it down, it's it's actually pretty simple because you know plants include everything from all the different types of different salads leaves that you can have to different herbs and um, right the way through to different fruits vegetables teas things like that they are all included when you're looking at plant materials so actually it's quite easy to be able to increase that diversity and the reason it's thought that by increasing the diversity of these plant molecules in your diet um is because first of all, it feeds the microbiome and the more diverse that your um, diet is, we know the more diverse your microbiome will be. And actually a, a very diverse gut microbiome has been shown to positively influence longevity and also reduce inflammation across the rest of the body. And the second thing is that plants have a huge amount of molecules in them that are actually very beneficial to our health. Things like phytochemicals, things like 
like flavonoids. These are all natural molecules that kind of act like drugs in our body. You know, in my time in drug development, I've seen that some of the most powerful molecules that um, we have tested are not your typical drug molecules and natural molecules that have come out of plants or, or natural, um, you know, d extracts from different leaves and, and herbs and things like that. Because the body has no idea what is a, a molecule from a plant or a drug or a supplement. They all have equally as powerful biological effects. So when people say that food can be medicine, it literally can because some of those molecules are just as powerful, if not better than some of the drugs that we, we currently take um, as a population. Is, it, is there any um, evidence that the bacteria are helping us get more from the food as well? Because I, I know um, when, I, when you start to look into what bacteria do, it's not just, you know, you always learn to help you digest your food. But what I mean, that really means like converting one, sometimes converting one molecule into another. Yeah, so we know that people have different absorption of different types of foods and different molecules depending on the bacterial composition of the gut. So different bacteria are breaking down some of our food before it's even absorbed and digested. So if you don't have some of the beneficial bacteria for that, then naturally you're not going to absorb as many of the uh, beneficial molecules as, as what you could be. So the composition of our gut bacteria does directly link to not only our diet but what we're actually absorbing from that diet so mm -hmm. that's really important yeah so because i was trying to figure out when i first did this test myself with the zoe program we were talking about um I, thankfully i had good diversity but i was like why what is it that's specifically good about that particular thing and um, this makes it a little bit clearer which is you you simply cannot you you probably aren't absorbing the same amount of stuff if you've got a narrow um, spectrum of, of gut bacteria so you essentially certain things may not even be available to your body is is that the primary mechanism is it even a thing because I've only just thought of it now yeah no yeah. It, it is absolutely that you know the more diverse the bacteria the more that there's going to have the different bacteria that are able to break different things down to help with absorption and I think you've just brought up a really cool test which is the zoe test and for, for people that haven't heard of that that is um measuring a couple of different things it's it's looking at personalized nutrition by looking at the composition of your gut microbiome so what is going on inside your gut um, it looks at how fast your body is able to remove sugar from the diet when you eat um, anything carb with carbohydrates or sugar in it. And it also looks at how fast your body is able to remove um, triglycerides or fat from the diet because each of those different things are different in everyone. And the differences between people means that they will respond to different diets in different ways so this is exactly the reason why i would never say to someone you should be following a keto diet or you should uh, be following a high protein diet or um you know basically saying that this is going to suit everyone because it won't so i don't know what experience you had when you did the zoe test but certainly for me it, it was very interesting because you um basically eat um some i did you do cookies or muffins Muffins. Muffins, yeah. So you, you you either get cookies or you get muffins that are have a very particular concentration or amount of uh, fat and sugar in them. And you wear a continuous glucose monitor that tracks how your body deals with the sugar. And also you do a finger prick blood test to look at how quickly uh, your blood will get rid of, you get rid of the fat out of your blood. And basically... Um, when I ate the muffins, um, my results showed that I actually remove uh, glucose very slowly or sugar very slowly from my body, which means that I am highly sensitive to sugary food and also carbohydrates, but I really rapidly removed fat from my body, which shows that something like a keto diet may be more beneficial for me where I'm restricting carbs and having more um, you know, healthy fats in my diet. Whereas, I mean, what did your results show? So uh, I'm bad at metabolizing glucose and also bad at metabolizing fat, which was sad because I was kind of <laughs> aiming for keto and thinking, oh, it's fine. Like, but uh, what, what was interesting to me is I did notice that if I was to have a meal, like a high fat meal, I would often f just even a small one, I would feel terrible. I would yeah. feel really tired for ages. And um, I don't know if that was the type of fat because also years ago when I first started and I wasn't aiming for anything other than re excluding sugar at that mm. time. 
Um, but I didn't feel great after a meal. And so now I'm now, since the Zoe thing, and now focus a lot more on, on the fiber side of things. So eating plenty of fruit and veg, a little bit of olive oil on top, still low carb and protein. And that seems to be much more tolerable. I can actually feel the difference, which is I just feel full. I don't want to go to sleep afterwards. And uh, so I, I kind of, I always like to try and relate the, whatever the data says to how I feel, because it makes me more likely to continue doing it. Yeah. And I hadn't actually noticed how bad the fat thing was until I got that data and thought, you know what, I always do feel tired no matter what. And I, and when I changed it, switched it up and focused more on, on fruit and veg and, uh, and protein, it was better. Yeah. So it's useful. And it, it does, it, it does show as well. So like for me, looking at my results, it would show that I'd do very well eating the block of cheese for my breakfast. But if I was to have a banana, it would be like alarm bells going off in my body. And that would cause so much more harm and inflammation in my body than it would having the high fat. Whereas for you, you know, you'll probably have to go on the more conservative side of not too much of anything or not one extreme or the other, because that is the way that you're naturally are with your biology um but i think this is is really interesting because it shows that one diet doesn't fit all um and that actually we, we should be pushing more towards this type of precision medicine or personalized medicine but as a general rule um you know in everyone you want to be eating a higher diversity of plant material we know that is is very good when it comes to longevity but the second thing is the the timing of when we're eating so as humans we are not designed to be constantly eating but in our sort of modern lives and the way society has has brought us up it's like oh you must get up and you must have your breakfast otherwise you'll not be able to concentrate and you won't perform well and then you must have a you know a mid-morning snack because you couldn't possibly get to lunchtime without eating and then you have to have your lunch then you have to have another snack and we should be eating all the time and we should have three meals a day when the reality is that this is something that's almost been manufactured by you know food and in industries because we were not designed to be eating continuously our biology is made so that we were out hunting we may eat and eat well but then go for a good while without eating again and this links back to to the hallmarks of aging which is dysregulated nutrient sensing in that our bodies are designed to cycle between periods of abundance where mTOR switched on where it's telling our body we've got lots of nutrients and we can go and build and build muscle and and you know put um effort into this sort of um uh, anabolic type uh, mechanism in, in our bodies but then we also flip between periods where we didn't have any food because we hadn't caught anything or you know there was there was nothing available and that would put our bodies into conserve mode where our AMPK pathway was activated and that was switching on cellular repair and recycling um, when we were in this fasted state but now as modern humans we're eating all the time so that means our body's like, hey, we've got all this nutrients. Uh, we don't need to conserve. We don't need to repair. And these amazing pathways that are sat within us that could be repairing our cells are never getting activated. So I think a, a much more important conversation to have is actually not just what we're eating, but when we're eating, like making sure that we're, we're actually going a period that's putting our body under a little bit of energy stress by fasting. Um, um, because this concept's actually known within the longevity space as something called homesis, where a little bit of stress is actually good for your cells. Um, you know, we don't want our bodies to become too comfortable because then none of these beneficial pathways are being activated. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's um, it's such a profoundly interesting idea, but also makes perfect sense if you think if you just go and go to a game reserve or something. In fact, they don't even work so well these days because they're too densely packed. But the average animal does not just eat whenever it feels like. It's a, it's a really hard slog to get some mm -hmm. food and then you feel lucky about it and there's days go by when nothing happens. And uh, in fact, I always, I always pay attention to this when I see, you know, if you ever see a documentary on um, you know, some Amazonian Indian and how often they eat, that quite often it's really infrequent. It's like three days will go yeah. by. And uh, what a great thing that we've solved that for humanity, but at the same time, we're actually not built for it. 
Yeah. So we're, we're, it, it causes a whole host of problems, even though you feel like you're looking after each other. I also think there's a Western paradigm of I have to solve problems by putting things in. And it's actually a complete shift to think, actually, you can solve the problem by not putting anything in. And it will do more than anything you can eat um, to, to make you feel better is actually just have a break from eating. So it's worth thinking about. And the only thing I always think when I think about hormesis is people, people think it's, the stress word is going to be very unpleasant. And it's, it's actually not that bad. Drink, drink some green tea uh, as you go through your first fast. And it's really not that hard. And by fasting, you're influencing multiple hallmarks. We know that fasting reduces inflammation. We know that it switches on autophagy, autophagy and, and um, mechanisms in our cells which are getting rid of damaged proteins. So we know that just by having this period of stress, that actually the benefits that you're getting at the cellular level, can, you know, they can last prolonged um, not just during the fasting state but continue to sort of repair and rejuvenate the cells and the body from within even when you're eating again oh that's interesting i didn't know it so it's not switched off as soon as you finish the fast you still have those i suppose those enzymes have been expressed and they're yeah i mean it, it does get switched off but the benefits are still there you've still got cells that have been cleaned up um, mm -hmm. that have had the cellular junk removed, the inflammation's gone down. Um, so that still happened and you know, you have the residual effects from that. Okay. So um, from a diet perspective, we're thinking that there, there are some general principles which are use, useful to know, but every person is different. Yeah. And, and I, I think your body will probably tell you if you pay attention, I think you can tell, at least from my experience, I could tell certain foods in retrospect were not good for me. Um, there will be those niche people will it'd be great to get um, annoy a whole, you know, because they're very tribal around these sorts of things. So like the carnivore people mm. or the keto people, whatever, they, they will come on and, and we'll maybe get some, I've heard you call it bro science. <laughs> but it would be interesting to, well, the caveat is it might be right for them. If you yeah. if you got food intolerances and your inf inflammation to almost anything that you eat and you switch to a carnivore diet, you're probably going to be better off. Um, but that's a very small minority of people. The average person is probably not going to be better off on a carnivore diet, so far as we know at the moment. Yeah, it, it is all, you know, there's always people that are going to argue that one really extreme diet really works for them. And that's probably because it does really do work for them. Mm -hmm. You know, it really benefits their physiology and their biology. But I think, you know, unless you are going to get all the genetic testing, do all the blood testing and really find out what you are more, you know, engineered towards, the best bet is just follow the basic principles of, you know, looking at things that are not inflammatory, increasing the number of plants in your diet and thinking about not eating so often. And, and when I say fasting, this can be as simple as, um, you know, just going for 12 hours, especially for a, a woman, you, 12 hours is probably enough, um, which can be as easy as having your last meal by 8 p.m. and not eating anything before 8 a.m. in the morning. And that's really simple to incorporate. For, for a man, the evidence is it may be a bit longer you may be looking more like 14 to 16 hours um, but again it is still something that's achievable <laughs>